So I'm looking forward uh, this afternoon to uh, hearing your uh, project presentations at uh, 4 p.m. But uh, in today's uh, lecture, we're going to be going through a, uh, a final topic for the course. Uh, this is a topic of um, somewhat different character than we've uh, seen elsewhere in the course. Um, it's a, a topic which um, is reflective of the fact that uh, in software engineering, we have to be uh, concerned in its software project. We have to be concerned not only with, with uh, technical things, uh, things uh, from uh, assertions and uh, different types of testing and path coverage and all those sort of uh, considerations, which are important. Um, and it's not merely processy, the process sort of work that's technical, like running a CPM algorithm for, the for planning scheduling or technical estimation. There's also a human feature associated with uh, software projects. There's uh, choices on the part of uh, participants in a project, on the part of the manager for those projects. And those choices have impact, very material consequences that um, are all too often not obvious when they're made. And today I'm going to be trying to alert you to some of the um, some of the some of the factors you need to, to bring to bear when you're thinking about decision making with regards to a project, and particularly when you're thinking about decision making that could end up impacting project quality. So um, today's lecture is going to be an example of how we can use uh, aspects of, of systems thinking, sort of a, a, a focused attempt to try to understand the system not in terms merely of its pieces, but as a whole. Systems thinking tries to deal in some sense with the science of the whole. And here, the whole has to do with the software project and its success. Its success is measured in various ways. Financial, in terms of the satisfaction of the client, in terms of the retention of the staff members on the project, et cetera. So, we're going to be turning a systems thinking lens to software project dynamics. Now, when I mention dynamics, what do I mean? What, is, what does the term dynamic mean? Anyone? I talk about, oh, the dynamics, uh, the dynamics of this certain phenomena were confusing. What am I talking about? I'm talking about behavior over time. We talk about a situation being dynamic it means it's changing over time perhaps rapidly evolving, for example, as opposed to static, that it's, it's fixed, it's, um, it's, it's simply set, it's constant. So we're going to be talking about the dynamics of software projects here. And we're going to be doing that specifically because of the role of decision-making in affecting those dynamics. The fact that choices, which may seem sensible in the short term, if they're not undertaken with careful consideration of some additional broader issues, may end you up in a situation where a project that could have been successful fails, where a project that could have been successfully meeting client expectations on time, on budget, with good quality, and having a high morale staff, a high morale set of software developers, and perhaps in the context of a growing company, how a project like that, which I've been privileged to be part of, can be turned into a situation where instead, because of the, the poor, um, poor level of decision making, the overly narrow focus of that decision making, could be turned into a situation where that project is unable to meet client expectations, goes from fighting fire to fighting fire to fighting fire to fighting fire, never having a chance to do proper risk management, never having a chance to test the software as much as desired, never having a, a sufficient chance to do peer reviews because you're always dealing with the new crisis. You're dealing with an upset client. You're always dealing with the next demo because you need another client because the previous one's unhappy and no longer wants to keep you, etc. And these are situations that differ night and day. The latter situation, where you're going crisis to crisis to crisis, it's hard to hire good people. You lose people all the time. You have to document things because 
It's a revolving door of staff. People are coming and leaving. So you need to write things down because people don't remember it because they've only been there for a short period of time. Because those newcomers are coming with fewer, with less familiarity with the code base, they have trouble contributing, so they're less productive. They're not contributing at the quality level needed. And the project is stuck. It's stuck in a in a uh, adverse situation, a kind of vicious cycle, which is very hard to break. And often that vicious cycle, truth be told, is broken by another type of constraint, namely those projects tend not to survive. They tend, the companies go out of business, the projects uh, dissolve because they can't keep up with competitors. This is not a minor issue. There really are projects of each of those sorts out there. There's many of, of each sort, and there are projects, and I've been on them, which go from the first to the second. Go from a high morale, high quality type of situation to a situation where it's quite the reverse. As you can imagine, I didn't stick around a long time after that, and that's, that's one of the problems that contributes to it. Okay, um, so we're going to talk about systems thinking in, in projects. And uh, <clears throat> I mentioned the fact that going between these extremes, sort of a, a gelled, high morale project on the one hand, <coughs> and, a, and a, 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 a project that's always in crisis, always reeling from one, one problem or another, never able to get its act straight with risk management, with the buggy, et cetera. These things are not accidents. They're not, not merely stochastics. They're not just things that happen to us. We're not just struck by lightning out of the blue. These things happen because of overly narrow decision. Um, people make decisions which seem to make sense in the short term, and they end up blowing back at them. They end up, they end up feeding back to them, in a term we'll define a little bit more technically later, with consequences they didn't fully anticipate. So project managers may require long hours. And for a short time, that's OK. For a short time, you can do a sprint. People have high morale. They get the project done, deliver. And then you let people take a vacation. Or you, uh, you cut down the hours, let them attend to other needs that have built up. But some projects just push, 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 push. The Velvet Sweatshop, they used to call um, some companies. And, um, and these things have effect. They have effect in terms of built-up morale. Um, using metrics to make decisions. So there are some project managers who say, you know, I'm, I'm number-based. I make my decisions based on evidence. So I'm going to be looking at evidence in the form of, uh, in the form of bugs discovered. In, in people's code in order to reward them. Those whose code has fewer bugs discovered will give pay raises to. Those people whose, bug, whose code is more buggy is reported by testers or has found in peer reviews. We, we will not give them raises or we'll penalize them or let them go. What do you think happens in that case? Yeah. Yeah, you stop reporting bugs. You hide it. It becomes combative between the software developer and the testing team. Or these bugs are discovered and told, told and whispered, you know, without the manager knowing about it. They don't really write down what's found in the peer review. They write down a sort of pro forma thing that makes makes it seem like, oh, all's well, great. What's the danger of that? Okay, so the information supposed get does get back to the software developer so they can work on. I'm fixing the bugs. It's just it's not going through the manager. What's the problem? You don't have proper testing to make sure you do like you fix the bug and you write down the Good, good. So so among other things, there may not be the testing infrastructure is rigorously in place, and it may be that the bug reports for the testing infrastructure aren't widely available to the to the testing team or more likely to the development team more broadly, because then the manager might find out about it. But there's another consequence, too, and that is the manager gets dis disconnected from the reality. Maybe the manager is dealing with a client or a potential client, and they say, oh, we have the finest quality code base. We used to have all these problems with code, and we started incentivizing people you know, by rewarding people with, code, low code, uh, with, with good code quality, 
and now we have few bugs. And of course, they're fooling themselves. Say, oh, the number of bugs came down dramatically. Well, the number of bugs that are reported to you, buddy, came down, but the number of bugs that are actually out there are just as many. But the managers can now make, will now make promises sometimes for commitments that are unsustainable. They don't know the real situation. They don't know how shaky the code base is, and the team doesn't want to tell the manager that, and that can spiral into suspicion on the part of the manager. These are not small effects. I've been in situations where you get in this vicious cycle with, with a manager of that sort. So, um, you know, this uh, judging progress based on, on uh, fix reports uh, can be related to that. Um, using abuse to scare team members into delivering. Um, shouting at team members if their code quality is not high enough. Um, and uh, intimidating people, um, uh, making people scared to come forward with a bug. It can lead to turnover on the part of the team, information hiding, etc. cetera. Um, so a common thread of many of these, of these um, decisions is that they're overly narrow. They don't try to, um, they, they focus on certain effects and they, they ignore certain broader effects. And as a result, things sometimes go bad very quickly. Snowballing effects. So things may seem like only a minor thing. We lost our top developer. But those things go bad in a, in a, in a, in a very quick way. You lose your top developer. The rest of the team has to do more work for the same number of people. They spend more time trying to hire people, or if they are lucky enough to hire someone, trying to train them. Their morality is, morale is lower. After all, their buddy left, and they've got to do more work. And it's easy to lose more people. And you lose people, you, you say, well, we'll hire more. And those people don't know the code base. They don't know what's in place. They depend on documentation, the documentation of the day. Things can get into vicious cycles really, really quick. And you can get in situations where it's in, stuck in a vicious cycle and it's hard to get out once you're in it. There's a, there's a policy resistance. There's a lock-in effect that makes it hard to change things once they're established. Once people have certain fixed ways of doing things or the, the, the reputation of the team is shot, it's hard to regain it. It's easy to lose reputation, quick to lose reputation, hard and long, takes a long time to regain it. Um, and it turns out that because of this in software, particularly for higher risk projects or projects that are more um, that are more tricky technically, effectively managing is really difficult. So we're going to be talking about how systems thinking can be one tool in helping helping to guard at least against some effects, helping to give a second a sober second thought to some decision making. It's not a silver bullet. It's not a panacea. It won't fix all the problems, but it can help alert you to issues. And system thinking, it's almost its, its um, uh, definition is a focused attempt to deciduously think more broadly about a system as a whole, not just about its narrow pieces, not just about small pieces in isolation, and to try to recognize a broad set of side effects statutes, not just the immediate obvious thing. Work longer hours, you, you therefore produce more code. You, know, you work longer hours, you're, you're producing uh, code over longer time, therefore you produce more code. You want to look at other effects as well, like the impact on quality. Sure, you may produce more code at 2 a.m. in the morning, but that code is going to have more bugs in it. And removing those bugs may add a whole extra amount of time that wouldn't have been required otherwise and, and more than make up for the extra code you put out and make you end up in a, in a, with a net loss. It means think about causal chains and feedbacks, thinking about how one thing leads to another and, and how we have these feedbacks, these situations where a change at one point in the system, maybe it's a change of morale, leads to a cascading series of effects that ripple around and either amplify that change or push back again. So a change in morale for the negative leads you to be at greater risk of someone leaving the project, 
someone leaves the project, you have a greater risk for in terms of adverse morale. It also leads to more work on the existing people and therefore leads to even lower morale through that. You lose your buddy, you lose morale because of that. You have more work to keep on your plate, you lose morale because of that, especially because it's work that you weren't responsible for originally, you're not familiar with it. And we have a feedback. It worsens the morale yet further. Mm -hmm. And we can diagram all sorts of feedbacks within projects in coming minutes. I mean, think about root causes, not just symptoms. Not just saying, well, we're behind, so we've got to work longer hours. You know, our code quality is, you know, we're showing too many bugs um, over time, too many new bugs, so we need to we need to reward um, reward efforts to uh, you know improve quality by reducing bug counts. It means thinking about the underlying causes for things and not merely the the ways we measure them. Not merely being behind or being over budget, but what's driving that? What's causing that? And if we can't get to the bottom of that, we may end up putting on a band aid for something that requires surgery. I mean, think about the dynamics, the behavior over time, how things change over time, and how things may go adverse or, or better over time. And the fact that understanding how things link together actually can give you an understanding of that behavior, how things will evolve. Okay. Um, so why are we discussing this? Well, software quality is a systems issue. If you divide things always up into parts, and you only study those parts, you're going to see the trees but not the forest. You're going to end up making decisions which are narrow-minded and which end up coming back to bite you. Okay? Um, and historically, the system side of, of, of quality has been underplayed. I won't say ignored. There's some great volumes. Weinberg has a four-volume set on software quality, which is just chock-a-block full of systems thinking and great stuff. And uh, DeMarco, um, for example, has a couple of books which, which talk about this. His book Slack, uh, Waltzing with Bears, uh, others. Um, great volumes. And there's a number of others as well who have contributed. But it tends to be underplayed. And one of the things I most want to stress here, folks, and we're going to come back to this with a diagram in another half hour or so, is the fact that product quality is at the heart of this. Software quality, for reasons that may not be obvious, ends up playing an absolutely key role in the success or failure of a project. Okay? So, so what I'm trying to say is, well, we're going to have a complex system, and we're going to take a look at diagramming that out, which involves all sorts of things, like morale and, and the number of people on the project and the number of bugs that have been discovered and bugs undiscovered and uh, the hours people work, and all that sort of stuff. At the heart of driving it, at the heart of dictating whether a project is a success or failure, at the heart of whether it is uh, a pleasant project to work in or not, at the heart of morale, at the heart of tur project turnover, at the heart of client satisfaction, at the heart of revenue, at the heart of of the uh, ability of the project to attract good people is quality. And if you neglect quality, you can throw the rest of them out of the window. It's that big of a determinant, and we'll see why. It's both a symptom and a cause of the success and failure of projects. It's one of the best signs there's something off, but one of the best dri or one of the most key drivers as to whether it's succeeding. Okay, um, and I've listed some things here that are impacted by quality. This is why in this class, when I when I um, urge you, invade you, um, exhort you to focus on quality, I'm doing so because not because of some aesthetic reason. Although it's good to develop a sense of code aesthetics. It's not merely because of some pristine ivory tower notion of how code should be. It's because if you don't attend to it, you'll be screwing yourself over and screwing your colleagues, screwing your clients, and cutting short your opportunities in life. So 
project quality is perhaps the most critical central determinant in project success. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to end up exploding into many different factors in terms of how it impacts things. Many of them are list here, listed here. Okay, so I'm going to be introducing some diagrams. And in order to learn to read them, I just want to spend a few minutes uh, helping acquaint yourself with some, some new pages. So um, I've shown here a, what's called a causal loop diagram in its most simple form. And we're going to be going from this sort of diagram to progressively more, more uh, involved diagrams and ending up in one that's, that's actually quite, uh, quite involved, um, this on the way, um, and something like this. And we're going to be taking a look at where quality fits in. But we have to learn to walk before we can run, we have to take one step at a time. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to undertake what may seem like a bit of a diversion, and we're going to learn how to read this. So this is a causal diagram, and it depicts the relationship between different factors of the system, as shown in with words, and links them up in a way that it indicates a hypothesized causal relationship between them. So in this case, um, an increase in mistakes leads to, lear to more learning from mistakes. That's why we have a plus here. An increase in mistakes, all of the things being equal, will tend to increase learning from mistakes compared to the value it otherwise would have had. And an increase in learning from mistakes will tend to decrease mistakes all other things being equal compared to the value it otherwise would have had. So there's, there's causality here, that if you put, if there's more of these, you tend to get more learning, and if you increase learning, you tend to get fewer of these. Why fewer? Because there's a negative sign. Can you see that? No? Okay. Um, now there's some math uh, involved here, and for those who are comfortable with partial derivatives, it's best to understand them in terms of partial derivatives. I've provided some definitions here. So again, a plus would mean all else remaining equal. If A is connected to B with a plus sign, that's a positive polarity link. All that things being equal, and an increase in A will tend to increase B above the value it otherwise would have had. Mm -hmm. It'll tend to lead, perhaps immediately, perhaps over time, over longer time perhaps nearly immediately, perhaps over a longer time, to B being larger. If A decreases, it would tend to lead to B decreasing. Okay? So, in other words, if, if mistakes here were to, to be decreased, our learning from mistakes would tend to be decreased. If mistakes would be higher, our, our learning from mistakes would be higher. Does that make sense for a positive connection? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, for a negative, well, for a negative connection, if A is connected to B with a, a negative sign, let's take, for example, learning from mistakes to mistakes. An increase in learning from mistakes will tend, all other things being equal, to lead to a decrease in later mistakes. Okay. Does that make sense? I'm not asking about whether you think this is true or not, but just the basic definition. Do you understand the definition? Okay. Remember, these are diagramming hypothesized understanding of how the world works, and, and that it can be ways of sort of capturing our reasoning about how things work, how these factors are linked together. And a given diagram, you may say, well, it's more plausible or less plausible. But there are ways of getting that understanding out of our head and into a place that we can all look at, we can critique, we can refine, we can improve, rather than having it trapped in our heads about how things work. Okay. Um, now, we're going to be going from uh, polarity of a link to polarity of a whole causal chain, from one thing to the next to the next. And this will provide us with the key understanding we need, ladies and gentlemen, to understand the polarity associated with loops and feedbacks. And that's going to make a big difference because those feedbacks often shape the behavior 
They fundamentally change the behavior of what can be expected. They may dominate the system and lead it to undergo lock-in or lead it to go, go uh, south in a hurry, get, get really bad. Okay. Um, so when we're going from one link to a set of links, we need to be reasoning about each in turn. And when you want to reason about the polarity of each link, it's best to do so by asking the question, to, to figure out the polarity, ask about if, if, this, if A were to increase, would B, your fatigue, tend to increase or decrease compared to the value it otherwise would have had? Um, and similarly for fatigue, if fatigue were to increase, would efficiency tend to increase or decrease compared to the value it otherwise would have had? Well, it would, it would decrease. So you focus, to derive that, to derive that polarity associated with that length, you focus on that length in isolation. But then we can reason through the polarity associated with whole paths here. Okay? So, for example, if we look at overtime here, um, we may say, well, you know, how does overtime affect work accomplished per day? Well, truth is it affects it in different ways, with different pathways, through different pathways, and which are associated with different time constants different times in which they play out. So for example, um, over time, in the most obvious connection, which a lot of managers focus on, over time will lead to more time working, right? You spend more hours at work, and that leads to more work accomplished per day, all other things being equal. You have more time at work. If your productivity were the same, if you were just as focused, etc. All other things being equal, you have more work accomplished per day, right? So on that lower link, that lower pathway, we um, we have a positive polarity. You increase over time, all other things being equal, more time working goes up. You increase more time working, and more work accomplished per day goes up. You understand that? Okay. Now let's consider these upper links. Okay, so. You increase over time, the question is how will it end up impacting work accomplished per day, say, with the topmost path here through fatigue? Well, you increase over time. Remember, this is after we've labeled the lengths. You increase over time. And all of the things being equal, will that tend to increase or decrease fatigue? Increase. Increase, increase fatigue. Will that tend to increase or decrease efficiency? Decrease. decrease. Okay. And if you were to decrease efficiency, it would lead to an increase. If you were to decrease efficiency, would it lead to a, a greater or lesser work accomplished per day? Less. Lesser. So there's a net negative path along that top line. It's composed of these set of smaller lengths. And we can figure out what the polarity is associated with the path by simply, as a rule of thumb, multiplying those lengths. The polarity associated with lengths. Right? If we have here we have one, two positive links and one negative link, right? So the net impact is negative. If we had two negative links, you know, A is linked in a negative way to B, and B is in a negative way to C, increasing A, all those things being equal tend to decrease B, decreasing B would all other things being equal tend to increase C, and so it's a net positive link. So we can simply multiply these uh, these polarities with two minuses yielding a plus, a plus times a minus yielding a minus, plus times a plus yielding a plus. Does that make sense? People comfortable with that? Okay. Okay, so here we have different pathways which we could use to diagram out effects of overtime as we hypothesize the amount of work accomplished per day. All models are incomplete. All models are wrong in the same sense that ma all maps are incomplete. All maps are wrong. Show me a map of Saskatoon. And it's wrong in the sense that it's going to omit features. It's going to omit that crack out in front of your apartment. It's going to omit the blades of grass that are, that are on the park you pass on the way in. It's going to omit the, the trees and their shapes, very likely. But it will be useful. It abstracts. It, it captures some essential details that are of interest. And a map is specific to a purpose. We, we will have a street map versus a map that's used for 
uh, reasoning about uh, electrical transmission or hydrology, where the water would flow. And we make, we use different types of maps for different decisions. And so it is with these models. They're thinking tools. We build them for a purpose, they omit certain details, and they capture others. And they help us think through issues in a way that's more consistent than what we do with just racing in our hands. So here we've shown in a model, it's more transparent, it's more, can be more critiqued and refined because we're all looking at it, lengths between overtime and work accomplished per day. And maybe that's my mental model of it at, at a rough level. And by looking at that, you can critique it and help me improve it. But I've taken it out of my head and put it on a piece of paper. Does that make sense? Okay. So the next step from talking, ladies and gentlemen, about um, these pathways is to talk about feedback loops, okay? Feedback loops in a causal diagram indicate feedbacks in the system being represented. These will be loops in the diagram that are represented, that are representative of feedbacks in the sense that a change in a given factor, let's say a factor like morale, or let's say a factor like, I picked that one before, so I'll pick a different one. Code quality. Change in that. Code quality going south. Getting bad code quality. May lead to an adverse change in people's, people's working hours, so it leads to more working hours, which tends to lead to more fatigue, which can lead to a greater... Uh, a greater number of bugs being introduced per each new check-in, which leads to worse code quality. That's a vicious cycle. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's always dominant. If the number of hours required is very small and it's for a short period of time, it'd be stable. But it's one pathway, and it's a feedback. That original change in code quality got amplified. It got, it got reinforced by that change. Decrease in code quality, required more hours on the part of people to debug, to test, etc. Longer hours to get the product to the client in time because you're fighting with these bugs. You're rewriting code that otherwise wouldn't have to be rewritten, and that leads to more fatigue, and that leads to greater chance of making mistakes, and therefore to worse code quality. You see how it's reinforced? Yeah. Um, and there's many of these uh, sort of things. So like in code quality, okay, you have confusing code. People who read that code, for example, will be less clear in where they need to make a change. So they'll make sometimes confusing additions to that code. They'll bolt something on, but they're not quite sure if it's correct because the original code is, is really confusing. And now you've got a bolus building up of, of, of even more confusing code. That's a, that's a vicious cycle. That's an undesirable thing. Here's a, here's a good cycle, something which a lot of um, web applications run for. Okay, so you know, the, more, the more existing users you have, the more people are coming to your site, the more likely it's to be listed on search engines like Google, and the more new users are discovering it, and therefore the more users who are on the site. More word of mouth also. This is this is what's called a virtuous cycle. It's a reinforcing feedback. A given change to say the uh, the likelihood of link, uh, listing on, on sites even pushes it further. Okay. Um, similarly, another virtuous cycle, word of mouth sales and and customers. More customers you get, they're happy with your product, the more they talk to their friends, and the more sales you make. This is something that marketers really try for. They want their products to go viral, people to talk about. Does that make sense? So here, folks, we've just taken our kind of rules for applying it to pathways of sort of multiplying the, the polarities to get the polarity of a pathway. We've just applied it to, to this. After all, here we have a negative, a negative, and a positive. So the net pathway from from confusing code all the way back to confusing code. The feedback that comes back around and, and amplifies that change is a positive feedback. And so it's an amplifying feedback. It's one that leads to, to, to um, further extending that original change, reinforcing it. Okay? So these are some reinforcements. And 
And, you know, people who are, who are um, used to thinking this way will recognize these things go on all the time. Here's some now fairly dated quotes from, uh, from Bill Gates. Uh, you know, the biggest advantage we have is good developers like to work with good developers. Uh, obviously, think about a reinforcing detail. Yep. Good developers, it attracts good developers, right? Um, so, uh, you know, many people don't get millions of people giving them feedback about their products. We have this whole group of people in the U.S. alone that takes phone calls about our products and logs, so we have a better feedback loop concluding the market. There is using the term explicit. The point is that if you have all these users, you can get quicker feedback about problems with your product and go to, to fix it, make it more responsive to users. The more users the internet gets, the more content it gets, the more users it gets. You know, obviously, this is someone who's thinking in terms of feedbacks, and for good reason, folks, because these sort of feedbacks have a huge impact on um, the dynamics, have a huge impact on what happens over time. Reinforcing feedbacks can be virtuous, they can be vicious, but they lead to very rapid change. They lead to reinforcing behavior that accelerates change faster and faster and faster. And this can lead a good project to go bad within months, or it can allow a company that's doing well to grow like gangbusters. Think about Facebook in its early years, double, 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 double. So these feedbacks are key to growth, these reinforcing feedbacks, but they can also be key to failure. Okay, so here's, here's, some, other, here's some other ones. Okay, so this is one I've seen in my software consulting, almost kill a company. Um, so increase in project duration. So your project's going to take an extra two months to deliver to the client. There's more change requests that come in. The client says, hey, I'd like, I'd like you to make these changes. You know, I was thinking, our business needs to change. You know, look, you're, gonna, you're dragging us out for another two months anyway. Please put in these changes. We need these, or we need them now, or guess what? We've just been bought out, and we have to, we have to uh, put in place these new features because our, our, our new uh, apparent company wants them. So you have change requests that come in. And that leads to more remaining work, and that leads to a longer project duration. And your projects spiral out in terms of how long they take. Feature creep. Not to be confused with, confused with uh, creature feet. Um, OK, so um, uh, another, another thing. So um, we'll have uh, changes to schedule, aggregate productivity. So uh, changes to schedule can can uh, interrupt your kind of rhythm, getting things done, your, your good progress in that code, which lowers productivity, and as a result, you, uh, you have uh, you have things take more time, which is really another variable, things take more time, and therefore there's more changes, changes to the schedule. Um, here's another one I alluded to earlier. If you have an increase in project manager uh, suspicion, they lead to overbearing management style. If they, if they sort of start to crack down, start to try to tighten the screws on people, people are less willing to share information to them, and they get more suspicious, and they crack down even more. Vicious cycle, okay? Um, here's another one. This was um, identified by Fred Brooks in his famous book, The Mythical Man Month, back in the 1980s. So, number of new people. If you add new people to a product, adding new people to a late product tends to make it later, is, is, is Brooks' law. Why? Well, you add more people, and a manager may think, well, you get more work, you know, more people, you know, more hands on keyboards, get more work done, therefore, you're more likely to, uh, to make up progress and therefore be less late. But it doesn't work so neatly because more, now that, that, uh, pathways and shown here, but more new people leads to more coordination needs, and therefore more work that needs to be done. Sometimes more documentation, or more more uh, training or, or learning. It it also leads to the training load falling on the older workers, and who are often the most productive because they've been there for a while. Therefore, less productive work finished, and therefore look, uh, less in the way of of, of uh, relative progress. So here we have a bunch of these uh, virtuous and vicious cycles. These are reinforcing feedbacks.
folks, and they tend to lead to, to change which accelerates rapidly. By contrast, we also have negative feedbacks. These are feedbacks not in the sense that they're negative in their consequences, but they're stabilizing. Okay? Um, so we saw one earlier learning from mistakes. There are other ones as well. These feedbacks will tend to lead to a system which, which leads to, to some equilibrium. Um, we, have, we have these thrown our bodies in the form of homeostasis. Um, we grow hungry, we go eat, and that lessens our hunger. We get thirsty, we go get a drink of water, that lessens our thirst. These are negative feedbacks. They're also called regulatory feedbacks or balancing feedbacks. And we also see them broadly within systems. Some of them are, are shown here. Um, and uh, we get them uh, quite a lot in terms of, um, of actual uh, real-world uh, project issues as well. So in fact, we'll, we'll come and see those. Time is, is short, so I don't want to uh, go through this. So, so let's talk about um, uh, some vicious cycles that do come up in this context. So, one thing you sometimes comes up is there's time pressure, so you skip QA, you skip quality assurance measures, you try to get the code out quick, we don't have time to do testing, we don't have time for those niceties of project uh, peer reviews, instead we just got to produce code. That leads to a larger number of faults shipped with the system, given to the user, deployed on a website, put into an embedded system which leads to reports from customers, which lead to emergency interruptions from these customers, which leads to greater time pressure. And it leads to this, this uh, real risk that you're going, to be, you're going to be essentially bailing so hard you don't plug the hole. I don't know if you've ever heard that, that phrase. If you're in a boat, you gotta bail sometimes to keep the water from, from sinking the boat and you're bailing so hard you don't have time to actually plug the hole that's causing the water to come in. And so it is with a situation like this. We end up skipping the QA that would prevent faults from shipping. We end up neglecting risk management, so we end up getting burnt all the time by unexpected things which happen. We end up having few peer reviews, so the people in our project aren't familiar with each other's code, so it takes them a longer time to fix the code. We try to make a short-sighted decision. Oh, peer review costs too much time. We don't have those two hours to burn. We gotta get those hands on the keyboard and keep on producing code. And we ignore the, the effects that, that peer review would bring in terms of spreading knowledge, in terms of identifying bugs, and that comes back to bite us later. Because we don't have that knowledge spread, it takes longer to fix because we don't have those bugs identified the customer and then we deal with desperate customer needs, desperate customer calls. Similarly, vicious cycles in terms of, of uh, project decision making related to hours. We, we uh, alerted that to it before, so overload for a product leads to fatigue in the long term, leads to sometimes depression or, or people uh, feeling very, very low morale, which leads to low productivity and therefore Therefore, you'd be more behind. What's not shown here is turnover. Um, this is shown here. So we have turnover. So, you know, if there's a backlog of work, it leads to more developer fatigue. Um, what really should be shown here is developer hours, greater developer hours, greater development fatigue. That lowers morale. Morale leads to resignations, which lower morale as well. Resignations lead to greater amount of work per, per team member. And greater amount of work per team member uh, tends to lead, there's a minus sign there, you can't see it, to uh, lower team productivity. People are just thrashing, going between different, uh, switching between different products, projects rather than, or different particular tasks rather than keeping a certain rhythm to their work. And that leads to a worse backlog of work. So here we have uh, effects uh, endogenously. Is this a negative or positive feedback loop? Is this a in other words, a reinforcing or balancing loop here? Anyone say? Positive. It's positive, yeah. So it's it's a reinforcing feedback, meaning that it's, in this case, it's a vicious cycle. Morale goes south, you get greater resignations, which leads to even 
made it likely to blow around. Um, and then you have vicious cycles through this. For example, this loop here, if you follow it around, we have one, two, three, four negatives. So it's also a what loop? Reinforcing loop. Reinforcing loop. Okay. Um, so uh, when we, again, when we get in those situations, things could accelerate. Um, now, this is one of the key points I want you to care away from. It's, it's a point that managers often miss, but it's absolutely key. Folks, I talked about, in the past few minutes, I talked about reinforcing loops, introduced them, and noted that they lead to divergent behavior. They need to lead to instability. They lead to things changing faster and faster and faster. They may be changing for the good. The iPhone sells like hotcakes because people get one, they talk to their friends, they get interested in getting them and it spreads. Or it may go south in a bad way and, it, and, and have this a vicious cycle of sorts involving morale and resignations, for example. Um, we talked about negative feedbacks, which are feedbacks that are balancing which are feedbacks where a given change ripple leads to, to effects that ripple around, that cascade around, and push back against that original change. You get hungry, you get more hungry, more likely to get something to eat, and therefore decrease the hunger. So it counteracts that original change, push back against it. Right? You make mistakes, hopefully you learn from your mistakes, and therefore, you tend to make fewer mistakes in the future. That original change is pushed back against by the response. You get tired, you go to sleep, and you being less tired. So that original change is pushed back against by the consequence. And it tends to lead to stability. That's why we can live. That's why we can regulate our temperatures outside. That's so why we can circulate outside even when it's very cold, whereas lizards aren't so lucky. They're cold blooded. Oh, um, thank you. Um, so, uh, so we have these regulatory loops, and they keep things in balance. And one of the things you got to realize is there's things in balance like that with, within, um, within uh, uh, actual projects. So. For example, when people get fatigued, they may take time off to unwind. They may end up, you know, taking taking time and things that allow them to uh, to uh, you know have greater chance to to recuperate. Doing a vacation, for example, taking a, a full a full weekend or extra day a week off, etc. And they release that fatigue. Fatigue is a very real thing. People can quantify it, measure it. There's people who, who uh, study the effects of fatigue. And there's known scientific studies which examine its effect on productivity. And if you examine, for example, the impact of longer hours, you find that after a while, not only do those longer hours have lower productivity, but they have net negative effect. Not only is the extra hours worked okay, less less productive because you know you're taking personal phone calls and you're you're needing to um, to to do personal emails all through it, etc. But now you're actually working so much less productively all through the day that it's a net negative effect. It's as if you took away hours. These are real effects. They've been measured, quantified, and they're known to to the effect. So fatigue and this ability to reduce fatigue is key. The ability, you know, when people's morale is low, to engage in morale building activities. In some groups they've been in, that means going out and seeing a movie together. Maybe it means going out and, and having a, a game of badminton or volleyball. Maybe it means taking some time and, and you know, going, remember at Microsoft they used to, there was a group that would go flying together. Um, they had their private planes. Um, I didn't have one, by the way. Um, and uh, and they, you know, have some time off on on weekends and do some things together, which help team morale. Um, 
The problem is, folks, guess what happens when a project gets behind, tends to get behind, tends to be behind schedule? What's a manager's first impulse often? Overtime. Yeah. And you end up cutting these regulatory factors. These are regulatory factors. That's why they're shown in Weinberg's quality software management. He showed us a negative link as, as having a circle here. So it's a balancing loop. This fatigue reducing activity balances out fatigue. It's like you get hungry, you go eat. You get thirsty, you go sleep. So it is with fatigue reducing activity, brown building activities on a healthy product project. But the problem is that one of the first things a manager may look for is opportunities for saving, to get people to work longer hours, to buckle down, work those weekends, etc. And they end up cutting these things. And that is often where things start going wonky on these projects. Because these things that have kept them in balance, these things that have kept them closer to an equilibrium are now cut. And what's shown elsewhere tends to be positive feedbacks here. Tends to lead to instability, tends to lead to a diversion. And in ways we'll see much more so than are diagrammed here, the project can end up in a very bad way. So one of the key things you got to realize is that when there are balancing phenomena in the form of regulatory loops, when drawn a diagram like that, often they end up forming a key component of the behavior of the system. And it can be a very good behavior in terms of balancing out adverse effects. In this case, it's things which counteract the positive feedbacks. Because when we have systems like this, we'll often have several feedbacks competing. So, for example, you know, here we'll have a feedback that, that um, whereby work pressure increases productivity. You feel, okay, I gotta get, I gotta buckle down, I gotta be focused on this and get things done. At the same time, it leads to fatigue. And you're gonna have these feedbacks competing with each other. This is a negative feedback. It leads to less work remaining and therefore less work pressure. But this one is a positive feedback. And for a while, this one might dominate. And you're able to get through the hump of work and, and get through the semester and finish it off. On the other hand, if things start to go this way, they start to go, as we say, non-linear. We start to we start to have a lack of elasticity. This work remaining loop, this, this bouncing loop, it's like a rubber band pulling the project back into position, keeping it in balance. This positive loop is like something stretching, and at some point that rubber band won't hold anymore. And it will rip. It will enter what engineers call its plastic regime. And it will rip apart. Okay. Um, so uh, to a certain degree, you know, our systems can be pulling back. If I pull at this pen, you know, it's it's sticking together. It's be much more dramatic with a rubber band. I end up pulling it enough. Oh, <laughs> and there we go. Uh, well, the pla my hands entered the plastic regime. Um, fortunately, my finger didn't come off. Um, okay, so uh, you know, here we can elaborate from one loop to several loops, and these loops are competing. And we can end up elaborating the further, put in additional factors. For example, um, developers distrust the manager, managerial distrust the developers, and having a project sort of diverge in terms of the ability to control it. Um, I'm going to skip forward, because we have uh, little time uh, left. I'm going to skip forward to a, uh, a key slide here. Um, and this is a bigger picture that integrates a bunch of loops I would have gone through to kind of build up some intuition. And this tries to depict a variety of factors associated with, um, with software projects. It does omit some, partly uh, due to space constraints and so on. Um, I haven't put an emphasis on factors that relate, for example, to sustainability of a product in terms of client satisfaction and funding. That's often for, for real world software projects, you know, if you're undertaking software for a small company, this is often key. And it's that which may sink you rather than anything else on the quality side. That may be one of the first things that sinks you. But what I have done is tried to emphasize here 
the links between a variety of factors. Many of them you've heard me talk about. For example, managerial pressure, overtime, fatigue, um, and uh, multiplexing of tasks, for example. But, and, and the impact of morale and resignations. You'll notice that, that vicious cycle here. But you'll also, in, in this training component, but you'll also note that I've highlighted here in, in red, in this red oval, a set of factors that have to do with quality. Okay? Um, and I do so because you'll find that they're a nexus, they're a sort of central piece for many other loops that end up affecting other areas of the project. For example, you know, the amount of work that has to be done relates to how late a project is. The quality with which work is done leads to morale. The amount of, uh, although it's not shown here, the amount of debugging work to be done will also tend to lead to, um, to morale. People don't like to be overwhelmed by the prospect of work. Developers, particularly the best types of developers folks, want to work on code that's high quality. They want to feel good about what they're doing. They want to feel they're delivering good quality product. They want to be able to, to work with code that they can be proud of. And therefore, this quality of release product has a very significant impact on morale, which of course leads to resignations, and it leads to ability to, to hire, hire new good developers. So if the quality suffers, folks, it'll end up affecting morale, it'll end up affecting through project lateness, uh, fatigue, and those factors will again affect quality. This is why I said earlier, in the first few minutes, first five or 10 minutes of the session, quality is an indicator, it's a symptom of problems, but it's also a cause of problems. So it, it, it affects morale, it affects project lateness, it affects the number of bugs that have got to be fixed, the amount of rework, of throwing away of code and redoing that work that we have to do. But it's also a symptom. So fatigue, for example, affects quality. The more fatigued we are, the lower the quality of code. Multiplexing of tasks due to managerial pressure, due to overload, due to the fact that there's now fewer people to do the same level of work because of resignations. This is a link that's actually not shown. Um, well, it, here this. Uh, it, it should be shown in terms of your work per person, but it's not. Um, that leads to multiplexing of tasks, less coordination, for example, or pressure for quick and dirty fixes, and therefore less reliable bug, con uh, bug fixes. And that can lead to new, you know, uh, a greater number of defects or, or lowering the actual defect resolution rate. So these quality effects are a symptom of things going on elsewhere in the diagram. They're a symptom of morale. They're a symptom of project lateness. They're a symptom of multiplexing. They're a symptom of managerial pressure. They're a symptom of overtime and fatigue. Yes? Are those slashes on certain paths? Oh, yeah. Have any specific meaning? Yeah, thank you. So the slashes here actually mean effects that tend to be somewhat delayed compared to others. So, for example, overtime has an effect on fatigue, but it it tends to be a delayed effect. So you can actually do short amounts of overtime, do sprints, and actually come out fairly unscarred if you allow people to unwind after that. But eventually it will have an impact on fatigue that uh, increases fatigue. Okay? And similarly, morale eventually will have an impact on thoroughness of testing. If people are just a daily grind, it's in, you know they don't feel good about it, they're, they're down and out about the project. They're really not interested in what's there. It ends up impacting thoroughness of testing, the degree to which they're really keen to you know, find, find bugs. Similarly, morale in, impacts the reliability of bug fixes. You know, if you have someone who's really fired up, get this thing delivered, this is gonna be a great, um, a great release, our client's gonna be happy, the client's gonna be really pleased, this is gonna make us as a company, this is, you know, um, a code base to feel really good about. Uh, we're going to let the world see our exciting stuff we're doing. That leads to greater focus and greater reliability of bug fixes. On the other hand, if this is just a, you know, just you're, you're being paid 
to do this job, you're just putting in the hours, punching the time clock, and you are, you're not really engaged intellectually with it. The way in which you'll, the acuteness you'll use to identify bugs or to fix them is reduced. It's impaired. How much so? That's harder to measure than productivity of bricklayers or something, but it's a known effect. And sometimes it comes out first in terms of resignations, but it also comes out in terms of quality. You're just not on as on top of it as you'd like to be. It's a pain. It's, uh, it's just something you got to deal with, and, and so you end up getting distracted by all sorts of things. So these things, um, some of them take a while to have effects, but the effects can actually eventually be, be pronounced. Okay, now I've shown this slide because I want you to realize how tangled these things are. It's not like you can separate out, you know, morale on the one hand from this issue of quality. It's not like you can separate out, you know, the issue of a project being, you know, behind from fatigue and from, you know, the unreliability of bug fixes. They're tangled together, folks. They're tangled together in a way that you tug on one of them, and it tugs on all of them. And the danger is that with software projects, often our managers, who may not come from computer science background, may not understand these sort of factors, tug on them in adverse ways. They'll increase the overtime. They'll reward things in perverse ways. They'll you know, try to uh, try to end up um, cutting down on on the effort going into peer reviews because I think they're taking too much time to reduce the amount of time taken, the delay associated with, or the, the time devoted to testing because they figure that it delays the project too much to get it to the client. And you do those things and it's disastrous. And it's disastrous in ways that may have long-term effects, like you lose your best people or people's morale takes a long time to recover. Their reputation is shot. And again, what I haven't shown here is the fact that these things have, this quality has on the client. Because a lot of products, a lot of projects, end up disappearing because this quality fails. And it's not merely that it has a negative impact on morale or in resignations, or in lateness, or in fatigue, and that it feeds on itself, that it, through all these vicious cycles, it, it worsens itself. It's that it also leads the client to be pissed off, or a client to be very unhappy, a client to not say good things about your firm. And I'll tell you, if any of you are thinking about going an entrepreneurial route, I've been there before, and it's a great experience, just be aware, your first client, it's like a make or break. You need that first client to be really happy with what you've done for them. If they're unhappy with it or indifferent, your prospects are greatly reduced. You want that first client to talk about it. You want them to feel really good. If they say negative things about you, it's, it can be the kiss of death to your company. How are you going to get that second client? They're going to say, oh, so um, are we your guinea pig? No, oh, we had a first client. Can we talk with them? Um, well, uh, they went under. Um, <laughs> great, um, great prospects. Um, they're not using our system anymore. Well, okay, so why do we want to use your system? That first client is key because you provide references from them to others. And if they love your system and they're willing to talk about it, there come your second, third, fourth, and fifth clients right there. Word of mouth, spreading, refer people to them, it gives credibility, etc. So if the client's not satisfied, your prospects for growth, your prospects for funding, your prospects for keeping people, prospects for getting good quality hires, they, they go bad in a negative way. So, so you know, the uh, I haven't shown loops associated with that, and I haven't aspired to show a variety of, of other factors. Um, I do have other diagrams which show the impact of, you know, when people leave, 
it leads the existing people to have more work on their plate and therefore lower morale. That's one of that's kind of implicit in this link here between resignations and morale. Um, and uh, there's other factors we could put in this diagram as well. But what I want to um, highlight is the fact that quality is so central. And in the presence of these sort of positive feedbacks, you can get log kind of that. So you can get a situation where once you're in a product, project where risk management is not being done, where peer reviews are not being done, where morale is bad, where there's a huge load on people to document things, again, omitted from this diagram, because there's such turnover, there's such number of resignations, you got to document things in an onerous way rather than keep them in your head where there's simply not time to do good enough testing. If you're in that sort of situation, it's really hard to get out of it. It's like trying to recover from a really bad reputation and without changing your name or something like that, right? Um, so these lock-in effects can make it very difficult to undo these situations. So when you step, folks, step gingerly. Be very careful about about these sort of um, short-sighted cuts, these sort of things which may end up affecting the things which are hard to quantify, but at the heart of it, like the quality of the code base, like morale, like fatigue, these things are hard to see. They're diffuse. They're hard to measure in a day-to-day in -a -day project. But they as much as anything technical, have a huge bearing on whether the project succeeds or fails. A huge bearing. Don't find yourself in a position where you diss them, where you give them short shrift, because they're absolutely central. And do remember that a lot of the fate of your project will hang on things that are hard to measure of other sorts, like the number of latent defects, the number of defects that are out there that you don't know about. So exercises like bug parties, which allow you to identify unknown number of defects, can be very valuable for you to kind of clue you in as to, you know, what sort of situation we're in, are we in? How, how close to the edge are we, are we skating? Okay. Um, so, you know, these things are unstable. Software quality, trust, respect, morale in a project, um, trust between a developer and their manager respect between developers, between developer team and test team, and uh, respectively to the manager. These things can, can be lost, and they're hard to quantify. In this human theater of software, these things are every bit as important as what I'm telling you about assertions or what I'm telling you about you know, testing paths and all that sort of stuff. And you know, often it leads to rash decision making in the presence of, 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 of real pressure, we end up kludging it, we end up cutting corners, and we end up flattening our face because we've, we've broken something and we don't have time to fix it. If you don't have time to do it wrong, you don't have time to, if, you know, if you don't have time to do it right, you don't have time to do it wrong. And we often take the risk or the desperate chancer and we try to do it in a half-assed sort of way. We try to do it by cutting corners without thinking it through, and we end up uh, in a bad situation. OK, um, along with this is a warning against heroes relying on people who come in and fight fires. Uh, some of the people who have studied systems thinking in projects um, noted nobody ever gets credit for putting up fires or preventing fires that never happen. What people get credit for is things that are obvious, big contributions that look like they're heroes. They come in and they they you know save a project from disaster, what have you. Preventing disaster isn't as glorious. And people don't get a lot of credit for that. Relying on heroes to save your project is a recipe for disaster. You're putting your your, your eggs into one basket. If this person leaves, it can lead to resentment within the team. It can lead to bad morale on the part of other people. And, and you end up short-circuiting learning. Sometimes you have uh, 
risk management that got sacrificed because you're relying on people to sort of in a reactive way rather than a proactive way. Um, and remember that long hours are often the easy way out. Best thing is to prevent need for arising, and sometimes it means pushing back against deadlines that come from the manager and not from the team, and, and to say no to requests from the client or from others, um, unless the client really knows the consequences. Be, you know, be, uh, be encouraged to, to tell them what the consequences will be, even if it's unpleasant uh, to them. They need to understand those trade-offs. Um, Okay, um, those are all I have time to, to talk about now. I hope I've been helpful in terms of highlighting some links that are often missed on these projects. These are not merely curiosities. These are things which can have very central bearing on whether a company, whether a project succeeds or fails, and whether your dreams in the software area will become a reality. Okay, so um, it's been my great the pleasure and privilege to uh, have you here in the class. This is my last um, formal lecture for the class. I'll be giving one or two uh, review sessions for this class uh, where I'll be open to questions. We can go through a set of slides which highlight what I consider the most important things about the class. I've also, uh, since earlier today, been working to catch up in terms of posting all the uh, pub quiz solutions. So you'll find more of them on the website as of today. I'm hoping to finish up the rest in the next day or two. This afternoon at 4, you have your presentations. And I'll, of course, uh, be here to, to listen to them. And I'm going to look forward to going through your projects over the next few days. I, the, the marker is behind in marking the quizzes, partly because I'm behind in getting him the solutions. Um, so uh, I have to do that. And we'll try to get those, those quizzes for you by the beginning of next week. OK? Our, our, our actual exam is not until late in the month, but I'm sure you'll, you'll benefit from getting some feedback in terms of, of the, uh, the quiz results. Okay? So I'll see you today at 4 p.m. Thanks very much.